Hello and welcome back to my most inconsistent method for screaming for help. If you're a longtime fan of Yu Yu Hakusho, I'm sure you've wondered if there are movies because a feature film starring our goodest of boys sounds pretty neat. Well, fortunately you're in luck because there are two. Well, one and a half. Well, one and one third. The first is Yu Yu Hakusho the movie, also known as The Golden Seal, which we'll talk about another day. The second, in today's subject, is Yu Yu Hakusho the movie Poltergeist Report, which, depending on where you live and how you want to translate the title, it could translate to Poltergeist Report the movie, Poltergeist Report. Released in Japan in 1994 and then given the dub treatment in 1998, it's natural to want to watch this film during or after the journey through the anime. Now when you think of Team Yurameshi, you could probably imagine their voices without much difficulty. If I were to put some of their memorable dialogue in front of you, I'd be willing to bet that when you read it, you'd hear their very specific voices in your head. So spare a thought for any soul, myself included when I was younger, that was excited to see and hear our boys go on a movie length adventure. So what even is this movie about? What's with the weird voices and why doesn't anyone ever really talk about it? We'll certainly get into that, but before we do, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for watching, and I appreciate everyone that reached out with positive words after my channel update video went live. Feel free to join us on Discord, where you can be part of a chill and growing community of people with similar interests, and also feel free to give me a follow over on Twitch.tv Somewhere Past Never, where I stream four times a week, playing a variety of games. Last but not least, a huge shout out to these wonderful people for the continued support on Patreon. If you want to see videos earlier than they go live on YouTube, or support the channel in any way, feel free to head on over to the Somewhere Past Never Patreon page. In fact, at the end of this video, I've included clips of a watch party where me and some patrons watch the Yu Yu Hakusho movie together, and our collective laughs and giggles at a lot of things that happen in the film. I want to do more of this kind of thing in the future, so who knows, maybe I'll see you there. Links to everything will be in the description below. But enough with the plugging, what is the Poltergeist Report even about? Well, let's dive on in and go through it together. I highly doubt this movie is canonical, and I'm willing to bet it isn't, but for those curious where this would hypothetically fall within the timeline, it would take place in the one month period after the Dark Tournament but before Chapter Black. Two things give this away. Kuwabara dons his outfit from the finals of the Dark Tournament later on, and as we'll see near the finale of the film, Hiei knows the Dragon of the Darkness flame technique. When the film begins, an unnatural storm has blown through Spirit World, and we get our first indication that either Koenma was hitting puberty hard, or something was terribly wrong. Hmm, what the hell's going on here? Okay, so... so maybe it's just Koenma, you might be telling yourself. But then our favorite anime ogre bursts in. <laughs> Lord Koenma! What is it? The River Styx is- The River Styx is overflowing due to the storm, which begins to flood Koenma's palace, forcing most people to retreat. Botan shows up, and surprisingly, she's the closest to her Funimation counterpart vocally, and puts on the best performance in the entire cast, honestly. Koenma gives Botan what we find out later to be the Netherworld Orb, and tasks her with taking it to Yusuke for safekeeping. On her way out, though, Botan forgets that after a rain dance setup, Thunder has 100% accuracy, which doesn't go well for her as a ghost flying type. We switch to Yusuke's school where he's just chilling on the roof when suddenly Botan comes falling out of the sky. She's conscious long enough to tell him to seek out a character named Hinageshi, which Yusuke proceeds to do after pawning off our favorite blue-haired reaper on Keiko. Yusuke and Kuwabara set out to find Hinageshi, and if we set aside the utter disappointment that is Kuwabara's voice, I do actually want to touch on just how slick the animation is for this movie. There's a brief fight scene that kicks off and it just looks so good! It's the most noticeable when Kuwabara is dicing up demons like he's been playing Beat Saber. The fluidity of it and the detail that goes into making it eye-catching is worth praising. In that same vein, I found myself very much enjoying the muted color palette this film offers, particularly with the school uniform on our boys and Kurama's hair. Anyway, we meet Hinageshi while she's being pursued by a group of demons that are just having a blast with the voices. Get away from me! Rewatching this, I'm also puzzled that this entire group is having such a hard time catching Hinageshi. Yusuke and Kuwabara step in and make quick work of the epitome of fodder, then take Hinageshi back to Genkai's compound where they're attempting to nurse Botan back to health. This is where we get to hear both Genkai and Kurama's voices. I'm not sure. It's still in the balance. The spirit world. It... it was... it was gone. Who are you people?! So Kurama shows up and is like, Dog, I went to spirit world. This shit's basically an aquarium now. Hinageshi clues us in that despite what Team Yurameshi thought, there are actually four realms instead of three. Human world and spirit world are essentially companions to one another, and the demon world once had a corresponding companion realm known as the netherworld. A hot minute ago, the netherworld went to war with spirit world in an attempt to gain control over human world, but ended up being beaten back and banished into space. Not a separate dimension, not a magic prison, space. Oh yeah, they also call him Kuahara in this movie, so there's that. 
I, the mighty Kazuma Kuahara, shall resolve everything for all of us. Kurama mentions seeing some demons with crosses on their heads frantically looking for something, which surprisingly isn't the setup for another sequel to the Da Vinci Code, but was instead a band of demons from the Netherworld. In order to mitigate the ongoing disaster that is now SeaWorld's Spirit World location, Hinageshi instructs Team Yurameshi to locate five elemental sites within the human world, all conveniently located in the same city. The sites represent the same elements you need to summon Captain Planet, just substitute heart for spirit. The goal is to unseal these sites to send an influx of power back to Spirit World to restore it to normal, so in that sense, it's also a bit like Final Fantasy. Then we're introduced to Yakumo, the king of the netherworld who, for very obvious reasons, I'm going to call Eyebrows McGee. He summons his trio of followers to his side and then promptly sends them away. They're on screen for legitimately 20 seconds. It's the equivalent of making someone show up at your house just to tell them to go somewhere else. Hinageshi leads them to the elemental site for Earth, but it's already too late. Someone's beaten them there and destroyed it. I guess there's a distinct difference between destroying the shrine and unsealing it, because when it's destroyed by one of Eyebrow McGee's henchmen, they can convert the latent spirit energy into netherworld energy. And if all the shrines are destroyed and subsequently converted into netherworld fountains, the spirit world will become inaccessible forever. Which feels like kind of a massive oversight in terms of security. Also, shouldn't the spirit defense force be on this right now? Seems like maybe just a bit of an emergency. Also, also, and this really isn't important, but the length of Yusuke's jacket changes repeatedly in this movie. Sometimes it's the length of an average jacket, other times it's basically a denim crop top. The group comes to the conclusion that the enemy is ahead of them and they have to split up. But there's this really awkward pause right after they agree to do so, and the scene lingers just a little too long. I didn't notice it at first, but that's because if you look closely during the awkward silence, Yusuke's mouth is still moving! So the localization team just didn't fill in this extra dialogue with anything else, nor did they simply cut the scene short. So the end result is just this. Let's split up! Are you ready? Okay! Yusuke and Hinageshi split off to find the elemental site of fire that's hidden in plain sight in a parking gar garage? And conveniently, several cars have their headlights focused on it just in case the demons got lost, you know? Funnily enough, my first thought when I saw the scene was the horror as a car owner accidentally leaving my lights on and coming out of somewhere to a dead battery. Anyway, Yusuke defends the site and bonks one demon on the head who, for some unknown reason, bursts into flames? Sucks to suck, I guess. Eyebrows McGee shows up and immobilizes Hinageshi but determines she's not the person he's looking for. Yusuke goes to throw hands but gets punished for his button mashing and is subsequently tossed out of ranked matches. Eyebrows McGee destroys the fire site and you can tell Yusuke is in a good ass sleep. His mouth is wide open in everything. That's that I fell asleep in the middle of class type sleep. Elsewhere, Kuobara arrives at the elemental site of spirit and has a showdown with, uh, Majari? Majari. Maj that's his name, Majari. So Majari's shtick is that he can mirror any technique his opponent displays, but he seems genuinely impressed by Kuobara's basic ass spirit sword. But this guy's one of the three that answers directly to eyebrows is supposedly stupid powerful, but he never thought to manifest his energy in sword form? Kubara gets bested but then releases all of his spirit energy in one final eruption, to which Majari thanks him for showing him how to do that? Again, shouldn't you know these basic things if you're wandering around with the king of the netherworld? Fake it till you make it, I guess. You're doing great, sweetie. However, Kubara lured Majari into exhausting his energy because he knew he could beat him in raw physical power, which he does. Unfortunately, the elemental site gets destroyed anyway by Eyebrows McGee via an energy blast that comes from off screen. It's kind of the equivalent of getting tagged by an attack you couldn't see because the game wouldn't let you rotate the camera. Hiei is also in this movie, as a reminder. Uh, he doesn't really have much to do until he just suddenly realizes an elemental site is basically right behind his favorite brooding spot. When he goes for it, a demon comes crashing out one of the high-rises, which begs the question, was that demon just chilling in someone's office? How did he get in? Did he take the stairs? Can you imagine this guy taking the elevator? This guy. They take their fight to the streets and basically recreate the opening scene of Final Destination 2. At night. Hiei is then forced to take a dip in a nearby fountain by... Uh, this guy. Like, I know I was doing a bit with Majari, <laughs> but I legitimately cannot remember this guy's name. Kurama, as usual, is the only one competently getting his task done until he's set upon by the ghostly visage of his dead friend Koronaway. This spooky specter leads us into a flashback detailing how he died trying to retrieve a pendant. A pendant, mind you, that were never explicitly told why it was so important that he was willing to put himself in harm's way to retrieve it. Don't, Corona away! I need it! I need it! 
At any rate, the Phantom of Coronaway asserts that his death was Karama's fault to knock him off his rhythm, assaults him while he's basically having a panic attack, and then destroys the elemental site. Goodbye, old partner. Where have you gone? He's a phantom. So yeah, Team Yermesha gets beaten, and there's a lot of grunting in the moments that follow. <sighs> so the next day, the gang notices a barrier has been erected around the area where the Netherworld has appeared. Karama, in some new drip, explains that the reason citizens aren't freaking out is because of the Netherworld's impenetrable ability, gaslighting. Eyebrows McGee and uh, the, the other guy show up at Genkai's compound, where I guess she just forgets how to fight because at first she repels one of Eyebrows' attacks, but then immediately jumps in front of one without blocking and gets ragdolled. The, uh, the, the other guy, I'm just gonna call him Steve to make my life easier, uses a stab psychic move against Yukina and drops her HP to zero because her stats are abysmal. And yes, I was forced to take the time to level her up, but we'll discuss that another day. Yusuke shows up shortly after and gets fisted by Eyebrows McGee, who then makes off with Botan as a captive. This is the down and out portion of the adventure, so naturally everyone is upset for a variety of reasons. Genkai reveals that Botan hid the power sphere Eyebrows needs to restore the netherworld inside her own body, despite knowing the energy it held would overwhelm her. Yusuke's response is, <laughs> well it made me laugh. <sighs> Kurama hypothesizes that with the Netherworld extinct and Spirit World currently gone, Eyebrows McGee intends to use the human world as a foundation for the restoration of his homeworld. Okay, I think now is as good a time as any to talk about the bizarre stiffness of the dialogue, and I don't just mean the voice acting. The script itself has very odd sentence structure at times, and there's a noticeable lack of contractions, which detract from the natural feel of conversation. The goofy and rigid delivery from the voice actors just bring it all together, that's all. It doesn't help that Yoshihiro Tagashi didn't write this script, Instead, it was the brainchild of three writers, none of whom really seemed to understand the characters or their mannerisms. However, part of the blame does have to lay at the feet of the localization team since it's part of their job to make dialogue feel more organic when translated between languages. For an example of what I mean about the stiffness in dialogue, check these moments out. And banish their King Yakumo and his men to the cold darkness of space. Uh, you fool! I just developed a new killing technique. <laughs> I'll never be able to repay Botan the kindness I owe her. Kindness? I always made mistakes and caused problems for Botan. No, don't give up. I'm trying my hardest, Yusuke. We may have no chance in hell to win, but we cannot let it end this way. Back to the story, the gang marches out and again, Karama shows up with some fresh drip. That's his third outfit in this movie. Since Kulbar already beat his enemy counterpart, this portion of the movie is allocated to giving Kurama and Hiei rematches. First up, Kurama confronts the Phantom of Koronaway in Silent Hill. After some back and forth, Kurama finally realizes he's being manipulated. All because Koronaway threw away the necklace he'd been carrying this whole time. It quite literally comes down to, aha, the real Koronaway would never throw that away. Also, apparently Koronaway would never attack someone from behind, which is not something we as the audience were privy to, so this added information only continues to flatline what should have been a nice reverse Uno card. But we as the audience have no understanding of Koronaway as a character, so this feels really dumb. Not to mention, if the demon was capable of drawing out Kurama's memories in order to manipulate him, shouldn't he have known that the pendant was insanely precious to Koronaway? Hell, Koronaway literally died trying to retrieve it. On top of that, I also have no idea what this demon's name is, and he's about to die anyway, so there's no point in giving him one or looking up what it actually is. Kurama basically one-shots the guy and gets very out-of-character words of affirmation from Hiei, which once again really demonstrates that the writers didn't know what to do with the characters. However, I'm coming at this from the perspective of someone who watched the Funimation dub, so maybe this is something Hiei would say in the sub. But it just feels wrong, though. I bet a portion of that could be attributed to the ambient-laced performance. After some explosions down by the riverside, Team Irameshi is confronted by Steve, whose evil villain laugh screams of I wanted to be an actor, but I peaked in high school. <laughs> what type of creature is he? Hmm, a very powerful one. <laughs> According to Hinageshi, Steve can draw out the wickedness in the souls of his opponents, essentially slapping them with a change of heart card and making them do his bidding. Steve uses it on Hiei and it appears to work, forcing him into a Jagan state, which is the second time we ever see it ever, 
and then causes Hiei to launch Dual Dragons of the Darkness Flame. Apparently Hiei was never truly under the spell and turns his dragons on Steve, and the fight promptly ends. But not before causing millions and millions of dollars in property damage. Uh, side note, is it just me, or are these netherworld elites insanely weak? They're supposed to be genuine threats, but have been the equivalent of glorified fodder. Hell, Kuwabara beat one without spirit energy, just straight up launched him into the stratosphere. If this is how bad the varsity team was for the netherworld, no wonder they lost the war and got yeeted into space. Conveniently, the building that fell took down part of the shield around the area they needed to get to... somehow? Yusuke and Hinageshi set out for their final destination and, wait, Hinageshi could fly this entire time? Why didn't she just zoom away when she was being chased by demons at the beginning? The entire next sequence is just Yusuke running toward the building and then running up some stairs as Eyebrows McGee retrieves the power sphere from inside Botan's body. There's nothing really to note here except for the fact that Hinageshi's selfish ass doesn't give Yusuke a ride on her or at all. She really just watches this man run up flights of stairs while she's cruising. They arrive while Eyebrows is still trying to tug the orb out of Botan, who's putting up a bit of a struggle, and despite getting flung away, there's still plenty of time for Yusuke to do something to intervene. What does he do, though? Botan! That's it. That's, uh, that's the extent of his intervention. He doesn't even attempt to run toward the pair and help out. He's just kind of chilling there until Eyebrows gets what he wants and tosses Botan away. Botan and Hinageshi share an unearned moment, and Yusuke goes off to begin the final boss sequence. I have no idea why, but when Eyebrows digivolves, his voice changes. He goes on a standard bad guy monologue explaining how he escaped and what he wants to do, yada yada yada. Then the scrap ensues. Yusuke ends up on the ropes before too long, and a point blank spirit gun fails to end the fight as well. <laughs> Hinageshi tries to snag the power sphere from Eyebrows, and instead of just punching her in the face to get her off of him, he instead decides to swing his arm a bit. The power sphere is wrestled from his grasp, where Yusuke gets hold of it. And I am not kidding when I say that this ends up playing out like the finale of Guardians of the Galaxy when Peter grabs the Infinity Stone. So James Gunn has some extra explaining to do here. Yusuke can't handle the power of the sphere on his own, but through the power of friendship, they're able to safely disperse the energy between them enough for Yusuke to let loose a massive spirit gun. The fight doesn't end there as Eyebrows and his beef jerky arm try one last time to kill Yusuke, but Yusuke cooks him with another spirit gun. Never mind that they're fighting while falling through a building and should have hit terminal velocity and by proxy the ground way faster than the scene this takes place in. Either way, that brings the movie to a close. We do not get to see how Spirit World returns to normal and fuck you for one enclosure. So that was Yu Yu Hakusho the Poltergeist Report. But before we wrap things up, we still haven't touched on why the voices are the way they are. And the short and simple answer to that question is, the film just wasn't dubbed by Funimation. In fact, it was dubbed by Central Park Media a full three years before Funimation acquired the license to Yu Yu Hakusho. To be honest, there isn't a lot of information out there as to why this even became the case. It's just an odd orphan of history that exists outside the realm of the typical content that fans associate with this show. So why doesn't anyone ever really talk about this movie? To be honest, I'm not sure that a lot of fans on the western side even know this movie exists. I legitimately had no idea at all that there even was a movie until I saw Lanny Pator's abridged version, which made me double back to watch the movie first before diving into the parody. But doing so did make lines like this a bit funnier to me. Gwenmo, what happened to my voice? It is the power of the netherworld, my good friend! Reception-wise, the movie was met with a resounding, meh. The theatrical budget and higher animation quality were definitely highlights for people, but once the Funimation dub hit the scene, a lot of folks, myself included, just couldn't get over the different cast of voice actors. Interestingly though, that's not to say that there wasn't talent on the roster. Remember how I mentioned Botan being a particularly strong standout? Well, it turns out she was voiced by none other than Kathleen Charlotte McInerney, better known by her stage name, Veronica Taylor. Veronica Taylor also voiced Ash from the Pokemon series for its first eight seasons. She's got a pretty solid filmography, so even though she was early in her career, she was already familiar with voice acting. Eric Stewart, the voice of Koenma, was the voice actor for Seto Kaiba from Yu-Gi-Oh! and Brock from Pokemon. His filmography is much spottier, but just like his peer, he's had at least one iconic role in his career. Unfortunately, from my little bit of research, those two appear to have been the only genuine talents the project stumbled onto somehow both of which spent most of the movie either completely absent or damn near dead. The week of its VHS release, oh god, I feel like I aged 20 years just saying that, it was the 31st best-selling video in North America, losing out to such classics as George of the Jungle, Rage Against the Machine, just the, the whole band, I guess, Men in Black, and Hansen, Tulsa, Tokyo, and Middle of Nowhere. 
Wait, it'd been charting for 17 weeks? The movie appropriately vanished from the charts a few weeks later. Oddly enough, unlike The Golden Seal, which was redubbed by Funimation in 2011, the Poltergeist report has remained untouched. As far as I can tell, there's no publicly available information on why that is, and I'm pretty sure it's the leading contributing factor as to why so many fans haven't seen it. It seems like pretty obvious money being left on the table, especially when you look at how painfully fast the 30th anniversary collection sold out just recently at more than $100 a pop. I suppose it's just one of those things that we'll never really know the truth about until someone from an official source decides to step forward. But until then, that's all I got for you guys today. Another big shout out to these lovely people for the continued support on Patreon. If you'd like to support the channel in any way, check out some of the links below. Remember to take care of yourselves and others. I hope your days remain or become Saturnian. Thanks for watching and enjoy the reactions from their watch party. <laughs> this voice for Kawhi, but just say, like the voice is fine, but I don't okay, think. Okay, uh, in this scene, you're drowning. I can do that. Bro, <laughs> <laughs> really wasting his special move on fodder. <laughs> this is the point where he could use it like twice. Oh, Whoa! God. <laughs> oh god! Oh, and you look way older than usual. <laughs> you look yeah. like you're worse. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so used to my freezer sounding game Kai. This is a new experience. And yeah, there's resident, the resident hot girl dude. It, was, it could become a very dangerous situation. I will never get over her voice. It sounds like oh my god! It kind of sounds like Marge Simpson. Oh, oh man! I can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> even oh, even use case bomb to look fucking... at him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We gotta give her the more Simpson fade now. Oh. <laughs> I don't think the spray bottle look is at that little tooth. gonna help. <laughs> and the little tooth? Did you not see that? <laughs> I did. Very important we heard that dialogue. Wait, I want to hear more about the avocados! Where the hell is it? Why is Yusuke wearing like an extra small jean jacket? You know, I didn't want to be the guy who said it. He just finished watching Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I need it! I need it! I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it. I definitely. Oh my. Hey, Ooh, I like this scene. Oh. I like hey, yeah, yo. This, hey. See, this movie is redeemable after all. <laughs> His old partner. Is he alright? Come, Kurama. Is he gay? Is he, is he, is he gay? The answer is yes, but that's not the point. Collected at the evil power of those humans who are sent into space by the spirit world. I, can't, I cannot believe they're from space. The <laughs> yeah. They seem to get it makes us marginally stupider. So much better. Shut up! <laughs> wow, you really got in. He, <laughs> he was thinking of a comeback during those few breaths and did not get there. <laughs> They all live happily ever after? I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. No, go say it. Say it. I, I will say it finally but over. after the movie. Say the thing. I will. Really die. Say the line, boy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's not even. I didn't do it. Yeah!